Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of FFG Live. We're here today. My name's Evan Johnson. I'm joined by... John Schaefer. Yes, John Schaefer, you are the head of the miniatures department here. Yeah, that's right. And you are also an extraordinary painter. Yeah, I've been doing it for a long time, and I love it. Yeah, and as you can see, we have a ton of painting stuff spread out before us, including some things that you may not immediately recognize, such as... Ta-da! Nice. These new paint sets. What what are these? This is the first the world has seen of these. What, yeah. What's going brand, on brand here? New. So what have we got. Yeah, we decided to to make painting your Legion miniatures a little bit easier. That we yeah. came out with uh, three paint sets to start off with. You have a, uh -huh. a core paint set. This you've guy. got a rebel paint set and you've got an imperial paint set, and they're all full of colors designed uh -huh. specifically to paint your core troops and a lot of your heroes in the game. Awesome. So they so they have a bunch of kind of like the basic colors that you need to start. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me more about these paints. Cool. So they're all water-based acrylics. Okay. Pull them up a little bit, maybe. Oh, sure, oh, sure. sure. Yeah. Oh, these guys. Yeah. Yeah. So they're all water-based acrylics. You've got uh, standard. Put it in the loop spot. Yeah. So you've got uh, standard colors, which are like uh, this one here, which is called Blaster Bolt Red. Ah, uh, yeah. You also have some uh, metallics, which have these black caps here, like Astromech Silver. Mm -hmm. and in addition to that, you've got washes, like the Strong Tone wash right here with the red caps on them. So they're all kind of formulated for different um, applications, mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, they're designed to be thinned slightly with some water. Uh, they can be thinned down and put through an airbrush if you like as well. They work uh, and function well for that. And then the, uh, the washes in particular are uh, going to produce really dramatic effects for the shading and uh, contrast and definition of some of the shadows in, on your miniatures. Sure. Yeah. And it's not just the paints, right? The core paints that also comes with... These, yeah, these you brushes, get a couple brushes right? in there too. Yeah, some some so, good quality brushes to, to get you up. started on your uh, your painting journey. That very small amount of hairs. Yeah, there's two different sizes there. You've got one for like your basic yep. base coating and uh, size uh, one. Just general utility. Yeah, size, size one. Double zero. And a size double zero for all the details for getting in there and doing uh, like the, the minuscule stuff like eyes and belt buckles, etc. And so then we have the rebel and imperial paint sets as well, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. So that's a selection of additional colors that are not included in the core paint set? Correct, yeah, yeah. So the, they're uh, designed to be kind of additive. Um, there are mm -hmm. uh, There is one wash color that is in the, uh, the basic, but you're probably going to use the washes pretty often. So mm -hmm. we decided to double up on those guys Nice. in particular. So yeah, you have like a lot of great colors on the Imperial side for mm -hmm. doing the bases, um, base coats, yep. highlights and shading for, say, Stormtroopers. Sure, um, lots of white. Royal, yeah, lots of whites and grays, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's very handy. Uh, Royal Guard, there's a great uh, Imperial uniform color in there to do oh, all your nice. Imperial off officers or to do uh, um, general veers or other okay. people uh, okay. like that. Uh, and then on the rebel side, you have like a number of different paints that are uh, kind of designed around replicating the base scheme that we have on um, our photography for the core set, mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. doing stuff for like Endor schemes, if you wanted to do your uh, rebel troopers in those kind of greens and colors that you saw from Return of the Jedi, you can certainly do that as well. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's a pretty diverse offering, I think, uh, okay. right off the bat, uh, and I think that it will make your painting a bit easier because you can kind of just follow this prescribed method of using particular colors. Right. Even if like you've never painted before, you can kind of you can just pick this up, and this is like a, the perfect place to start. Yeah, right? for sure. Yeah, and they're totally affordable. Uh, yeah, good price point and uh, good quality paints. And we're gonna we're gonna have much more information on these paints going up in a second here on the website. So that not in a second, but shortly mm -hmm. uh, on the website. So you'll be able to see much more on FantasyFlightGames.com about these paints uh, once that announcement goes up a little later today yeah. and I just said that you know you, this, this place to start you can just buy this and you can just start painting and now we're gonna prove that because yeah. I have never ever painted a miniature before in my oh, entire life you're missing out I've never painted a miniature I've painted things occasionally but it's been a long time since I even did that okay but uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it now. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, totally gonna do we're it. gonna paint some things. Uh, and feel free to ask us some questions about painting techniques or whatever in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, I can shout those out to John as we're kind of doing this, since he is uh, a guru when it comes to yeah, I've been doing painting it for knowledge. Twenty some odd years. Yeah. Not to date myself, but yeah, yeah, yeah. A long time. Yeah. Almost longer than I've been alive. Oh my! <laughs> Yikes! All right. Anyway, so uh, I guess the. Uh, the, the place to start is kind of to talk with um, about how we prep these miniatures to begin yeah. with. So we're going to be painting Luke Skywalker today. Luke Skywalker. He is uh, shown here. We're going to be trying to replicate this scheme that we have right here. Mine will look exactly like that when we are done. I'm, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. But maybe, maybe, maybe it will. Maybe it will surprise me. That'd be great. Okay, awesome. So uh, what we've done in preparation for this 
to kind of speed up our painting time is that we've done, taken a couple steps uh, before we got started here. And the first one is yeah. to do, apply a spray primer. Mm -hmm. So that's super important. You want to apply a nice flat spray primer to the miniature so uh, this mm -hmm. uh, later paint um, layers that you're going to be applying to it will be a little bit more protected. They'll adhere better to the miniature rather than just the bare plastic. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of different spray primers you can use out there, a lot of different brands, a lot of different options available to you. But the most important thing is, is that you're using a spray primer that is nice Okay. It's nice and flat. Flat. Because if you have a glossy finish on there, it's going to cause all your paint to beat up and uh, mm. do weird stuff. So that's not okay. what you want at all. Yes, this guy appears to be very flat. Leaf. Yeah, very flat. So we yep. chose like a beige kind of color here, yep. which you can probably see right here. Yep, maybe move back yeah. a little bit. Yeah, right there there, there we go. go. So, uh, yeah, and we also kind of preemptively um, base coated the base mm -hmm. with a little sand crawler rust. Yeah. Um, because it takes a little while for those color. base coats, especially on the bases, because they're very uh, mm -hmm. textured. It takes a little while for that to dry, so we just tried uh, to speed up the overall process by doing that a little preemptively. Okay. So, yeah, so we've got the primer down on the guy, mm -hmm. we've got them based, yep. we've also kind of attached them to these little bottle caps here, which is not necessary by, by any means, but we've used a little bit of blue tack underneath here, like poster putty mm. on the bottom of that guy, mm -hmm. and we just adhere them to the top of this thing. It gives you something a little bit more tangible to hold on to while you are uh, holding the miniature, and also prevents you from kind of rubbing off some of the paint all along the base and along the rim mm -hmm. as you handle it and move them around. So. Yeah, I feel already more professional Do you? holding yeah. this bottle cap yeah. rather than holding the base. The you texture know, is amazing. It is. It, <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, it enhances my grip. Yeah. Uh, people asking when the, when these paints are coming out. Uh, you can look for them to release about about three or four months or so from now. Um, we may have some for sale at Gen Con. We'll see. Yeah, that would be But cool. right around kind of that time. Very awesome. Okay, so the place to start. Uh, yeah, where do we start? A, a big part of, of miniature painting is utilizing the texture of the miniature to do a lot of the work for you. So there are two primary okay. techniques that uh, really kind of facilitate that. And the first okay. one is called dry brushing, and that's essentially taking the majority of the paint off of your brush and whisking over top of the raised areas with a lighter color than the base coat mm -hmm. to accentuate the detail. I see. And okay. then uh, we'll follow that up uh, with some base coating, and then at the very end of it, we're going to apply a wash, which is going to define a lot of the shades, mm -hmm. uh, shadows, and uh, recessed areas of the miniature to really add a lot of the contrast that we really want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we'll kind of go back in and do some touch-up, and then we should be pretty close to being done. Awesome. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Well, let's let's get started. Let's get started. All right. So start off with dry brushing. So okay. you want to use a brush that is uh, quite a bit larger than what you might expect. So you're, you're kind of yeah. using a brush akin to this guy right here, one of these fellas. Okay. It's about like a quarter inch. This is quite large. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, this well, doesn't scare me. You're not, you're not intimidated. No, because it's large. I, it's like you know, I can see the brush easily. And yeah. It, it and well, the, the larger size it, it benefits you because you're not actually going to be getting down into those nooks and crannies quite so readily. All right. You're going to be kind of skimming over the top and everything um, as we go through and do it. So uh, the first coat that we're going to do for this base here to kind of make it a little bit more sandy mm -hmm. is that we're going to take a little bit of the Dune C, yep. which is kind of this this color, this color that we have right here. Okay. So I want to get like a color. lot on my brush. Right? Yeah. You want to load it up, but you, but be careful uh, that you. You don't want to load up um, your brush past this metal part right here, which is called the ferrule. Okay. So that is a good way to ruin your brushes if you get paint all the way jammed up in there against the base of the ferrule because sure. it will dry and it will cause those bristles to kind of fray out. Got so it. you always want to uh, be a little careful to kind of just load up the brush about halfway down the bristles okay. and get a good amount on there. Okay. So after you get a, a generous amount of that paint on there, you want to take this down to your uh, paper towel yep. and you're taking almost all of it off. And you can kind of see like how it's just, it's providing kind of like a, it's only really hitting the raised areas of the, the texture of the paper towel. And you're, you're going to kind of continue that until you have it almost completely off. Okay. Then you want to kind of go around the miniature and you want to kind of skim along the top of it. So you're going to be kind of just lightly drag it across across the uh, the raised surface to kind of accentuate all of the there you go. all of these areas here. Okay. I think you can see that a little bit better now. But you can see how it's kind of like picking out a lot of those raised stones and that sand that's on that texture. I guess case. one thing we also need to mention is that before we primed these miniatures, we applied a little bit of uh, white glue to the base and then dipped in a little bit of sand. Yes. And I like to do that ahead of time because then the primer coat will kind of lock in a little bit of that sand texture and mm -hmm. it won't really flake off as much as if you apply it after you painted the rest of the miniature after you primed it. So it's just kind of like an extra little protective layer that's going to increase the durability a bit. Okay. Cool. So we're going to kind of, kind of continue to go around, and Keep we're just going to kind of skim around. How's that working out for you? Uh, I don't know. How is it working out for me? I think you want to apply a little bit more pressure, just to um, so okay. you can actually start to pop it out a little bit more. Got it. You can kind of see here Perfect. with this fella that it is uh, starting to 
kind of like pick out a lot of those oh, raised snap, areas. Oh snap, it's happening. Is it happening? Is I it, think it's happening. It's unveiling itself before your very eyes? <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely happening. I'm seeing a change. Right, so this is, this is definitely a, a technique that you want to utilize on bases, on terrain oh, cool. in general, anything with like any uh, decent amount of texture associated with it. Mm -hmm. You can certainly do it on other miniatures. Um, like say, a, a technique if you really wanted to sp uh, speed up the overall painting of say Luke, for example, because he has this kind of like tan fatigues on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that you can kind of apply your base coat, you could apply a wash, and then you could actually dry brush over top of it with a lighter color to pick out all those raised areas. I will say that dry brushing on the miniature itself, something that is not overly textured like the base, sometimes mm. it will produce like a slightly chalky effect. Okay. And you're going to get a better result at the end if you actually kind of carefully line in and like go in and highlight those raised areas a little bit better. But we'll get into okay. that as we, as we kind of progress. So we've, we've applied that first uh, dry brush over top of here, but we're going to add just a little bit higher uh, contrast to that. And we're going to use a color called, um, what is this guy called? Tuscan Raider Tan. Tuscan Raider Tan. Yeah. All right, so can... I'm gonna, it's this guy right here guy? on your okay. palette. I'm gonna add a little bit here to mine. All right. And it's kind of like a cream color, kind of like an off white. I imagine I probably wanna like wash my brush before. You know, dipping it in. so with a dry brush in particular, you actually mm -hmm. don't want to because uh, if you're, I guess it has if to you're be gonna dry. introduce any moisture to this sort of thing, yeah. it's gonna kind of ruin the effect. It's not gonna work out very well for you. Cool. So when I'm doing these kind of successive layers with dry brushing, I like to mm -hmm. just go from one paint to the next and just kind of build it up. And if I need even mm -hmm. more contrast mm -hmm. and if it's try to, if it's still a middle ground in between those two colors, then I might actually dry it off or use a different brush. But I don't really want to go to water when I'm going to dry brushing. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Zegol is asking in the chat, what kind of sand are we using for the basing? Like where, where did we get this sand? How did, yeah, how so did, there's what, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's there's a number of different miniatures companies that actually supply specific sand, but mm -hmm. you want to get something that is, doesn't have, you, I don't really recommend just going out to a parking lot and grabbing a bunch of it because a lot of times you're going to have dirt and other debris and other stuff in there. Yep. You want to make sure that all the sand is nothing but little tiny pebbles and little tiny rocks Okay. because then it's not really going to do anything weird with the water or anything in mm -hmm. particular. So you can get uh, play sand from like a home improvement store, but that is going to be so much sand that mm -hmm. you're probably not really going to need most of that stuff. But um, I've used ashtray sand before for really fine grit. Okay. I've used play sand from playground before. You know? Sure. But I think you want to be a little bit um, discerning when you when it comes to just scooping up anything off the ground. Okay. Before okay. Before you apply it to the miniature. So don't just go yeah. to the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, let's see. Morris twenty seventeen is asking about the size of the bottles. They are 0. 0.6 fluid ounces or eighteen milliliters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a pretty standard size for. Uh, for most miniatures paints. All right, Tuscan Raider tan. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, so you, and you want to kind of keep this kind of towards the rim of the base, the very edges of it. You want because you don't necessarily want to just completely cover the previous layer that you applied. Sure. But you want to have a little bit more of a gradation. Kind of on this perimeter. Yeah, this exactly. Outside. You want to kind of just skip around the outside of it a little bit, and it's just going to just add a little bit more pop to the overall effect. And the reason that we're doing this so early in the process is that it's kind of a messy mm. stage. Uh, overall, and invariably going to go a little bit outside the lines, and you're going to get a little bit on his feet. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it's just not a very tidy technique because sure. you're just kind of like being messy and kind of whisking over top of it. So I like to get that done early, and then I go in with a more careful painting uh, after the fact. I think that starting off with the really messy stuff is is the way to go. That makes sense, as in life. As in life. Start exactly. off with messy stuff. Cool. Okay. So this fella has now got a dry brushed base. Okay. And I think that we're ready to proceed on to the next step. Perfect. Cool. So you want to wash out your brush, make sure you not leave any sort of paint or anything in particular okay. in there. John, show us the ultra close, please, of your figure. Here? Yep. Here you go. And point out that base and the Yeah, you can cover. kind of see here a little bit better how the how the base is actually turning out. Evan, let's see your yeah, show great. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah let's, let's see how sweet Evans is. All right. I bet it's awesome. Side. Yeah, just put it right there next to the guy. We're kind of tilt them both up. Yep. Virtually identical. Virtually identical. <laughs> we could even just swap them right now. <laughs> no, no, that's that's fine. Okay. Cool. All right. So the next stage, we're going to start doing some base coating. I want to dry my brush after I'm... Yeah, yeah. So that, that's kind of why we have the paper towel here. It just yep. takes off the excess water. It's super useful when you're going through and you're doing like some blending techniques, which we, we might get into towards the end of this. We don't really want to put the, the cart before the horse, but... Yes. Um, yeah. So definitely have a paper towel ready. Uh, I guess another thing to mention is we're using wet palettes here. Wet palettes are... Mm. Um, it's essentially just a sponge underneath a uh, layer of paper that's absorbent, that it sucks the water up through the bottom. It mm -hmm. keeps your paints wetter for longer. Okay. And it's, it's really useful for if you're doing any sort of blending in particular, or if you're going back and using the same color a lot of times, or if mm -hmm. you've mixed up a kind of a custom color 
The nice thing about wet palettes is that uh, you can then kind of put a lid on top of this guy. Mm -hmm. It'll keep those paints um, oh, wet nice. for a couple days, which is pretty sweet. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, definitely That's handy. way longer than yeah. I expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, cool. So let's start off. So uh, even, are we switching brushes? We are going to switch okay. brushes. Yeah, right. you want to go to a base coat brush. So I think for you, this, you want to oh. use one of these these black guys here. All right. So uh, size number one. Yeah, size number one. I think right. for you. Yeah. So which is kind of like a you know middle okay. of the road. Oh, this uh, is much smaller. Much smaller. Yeah. Okay. So what I what I often recommend to people for getting better brush control okay. is there's uh, kind of a couple of different things. Mm. The first thing is I think you want to kind of choke way up on the brush. So you want to get your fingers up kind of close to the tip there. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, close to okay. that. So you have right. kind of like less leverage, less yep. uh, range of motion. I More suppose. control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you want to kind of find like the range uh, of motion in your hand that is going to give you the most control. So for me, that's kind of like these last few digits of my fingers, which mm. I'm just kind of try to move. And then with my other hand, I'm kind of moving the miniature around so I can get a good angle on everything and give me a little bit more control. Okay. So it will take a little while to develop. There's not like one set method that's going to work for everybody, but sure. it's, uh, I found that it's uh, pretty advantageous to go about it that way. Okay. So okay. The, the other thing that's really going to help you out quite a bit is if you kind of form a bridge between your two hands, something that mm -hmm. kind of makes it mm -hmm. so you don't have one hand that's a little shaky or anything in particular. Mm -hmm. I usually, usually have a finger that kind of goes to the other hand, or I kind of put the uh, the palms of my hands together in some sort okay, of way. Okay, so kind of like lock your hands. Yeah, and then we're also kind of bracing against the table to give us a little bit more yeah, stability. Yeah, I've got my wrists kind of resting. Yeah, that inside. helps. Yeah, okay. The only thing you have to be careful of with that is if you're painting with other people, somebody might invariably kick the table and uh, sure. cause it to you know, go a little bit of okay. skew there. So. Well, that's not going to happen on this one. No, um, no way. The Groggy Dog is asking, any thoughts on wet palettes? So we're using them, obviously, but how mm -hmm. vital are they, especially for beginners? Absolutely not vital at all. I, I think that they are a handy, useful thing to have. You can certainly, there are a lot of tutorials online for uh, making your own. They mm -hmm. don't have to be an expensive thing. I find that the ones that are actually sold in our supply stores are a little bit higher quality, and a little bit more dependable, but it's uh, absolutely you don't need that. I mean, you can use uh, a piece of glass, you can use a, a Ceramic tile, you could use a paper plate, anything totally works. But uh, the ad the advantage of a wet palette in particular is it just keeps your paints wetter for longer. So if you're sitting on for a long session, mm -hmm. it's going to help you out a lot for uh, for maintaining those colors and those mixes and stuff that you have. Awesome. Cool. All right. So All right. what are we doing? So we're going to start off here. We're going to start off with his boots. Do you, right do you typically start at the base of the miniature and work your way up? Well, you know, honestly, I think that the best... Um, the best thing to do is to usually start off with the most recessed areas first. So if you think about okay. that, getting in there. So in the case on this Luke miniature, he's got his hands kind of in front of his chest. Yeah. Um, now we've we've primed this guy a very similar color to what we're going to end up with with his final color for his clothes. Mm -hmm. But I'm still going to want to put a layer, a base coat layer over top of this this base coat mm -hmm. or this primer coat. Um, just so it makes the color matching a little bit easier when I go back in and do the highlights and other things later. Sure. Because it, like okay. this primer color and the actual base coat color that I'm using might be a little bit different. Okay. If you really want to save a lot of time, it's not necessary. You can just mm -hmm. kind of go and, and paint right over top of that primer color if you wanted to. Okay. But I think uh, for this exercise, we're just going to go ahead and, and show you how to uh, base coat uh, the coats here. So, um, John Merrill, frame. Yeah. So I think if we go with... Um, this base coat color here, which is going to be this fella right here, okay. which right. is called Rebel Fatigues. Rebel which is Fatigues, quite, that's fitting. And quite getting, appropriate for So this. getting the brush wet, I see you doing. And then yeah, kind of yeah, so you want to take it to the palette. You want to, you want to thin your paints just a little bit. You want to, don't want to thin them so much so that they're going to become uh, transparent or overly runny. But you okay. do want to thin them down so much so they're not going to cause a lot of extra kind of surface finish. Sure, I don't or want to get like really lumpy loopy, or yeah. obscure detail or anything like that. So you definitely want to kind of thin down your paints okay. and kind of apply them in multiple coats. To okay. get better coverage, I think it's, you're going to get better results. That makes sense. So yeah, so starting first, it's going to be a little bit difficult for to see this on the camera, but I'm just going to kind of illustrate with my brush how I'm going to go through and do it. So as I mentioned before, we're going to start in here with these recessed areas underneath Luke's arms. We're going to go through here and paint this. You can notice that I'm kind of using my fingers to kind of brace up against the actual miniature itself to give me a little bit more control, and then I'm kind of just turning and moving this guy. But my my right hand that's holding the brush is kind of staying in a static position as I move around this guy which is just a more comfortable um, position for me to paint in, and it's also just going to give me a lot more control. Awesome. So just add a little bit of water, and then just as you apply the base coat, you just want to kind of thin it and spread it out as you go around. And we're just going to do his, uh, his shirt and his pants, and then we're going to pick out his boots and his belt in a different color, his hair and his skin and everything else too. That makes sense. Cool. So I shouldn't panic if I get a little bit on his No, balance. no, exactly not. So that's that's kind of why we're going through and we're doing that most recessed stuff first is that if we make a mistake and we go outside the lines, not a big deal because we're just going to base cut it with another color. Sure. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Alrighty. So I'm kind of 
moving through this guy relatively quickly. This is a, you know, not again, kind of because it's a very similar color to the primer coat that we put on here. Um, the coverage is not quite as vital, but again, I, I kind of want to just make sure to get a good base coat over top of this guy for subsequent layers and also just to, to make the matching of the color a little bit later as we go through and do some layered highlights. Sure. Uh, they're asking uh, in the chat if uh, it's easier to paint the miniature before assembling it. Yeah, so I think in a lot of cases there are um, instances where that is quite a bit easier. So um, with a lot of the Rebel Troopers and the Storm Troopers, um, for example, they have kind of like an arm assembly that then just like plugs in on either side of right. the torso. Right, exactly. And if you really want to get in there and be able to paint the, uh, the back side of the weapon that's like close to their chest, the underside of their arms, or actually the chest itself, you can certainly leave the arms off if you do it. Sure. I will recommend, though, um, that you be very sparing with the super glue that you add after the mm. fact. Because if you put too much super glue on there and you go in to glue um, those arms on, it's going to craze and it's going to kind of frost up a little bit. Uh, when the, the glue is applied too thick. For so sure. yeah, you just want to be really kind of careful with that. So um, my personal preference is to just assemble the miniature entirely because I, I feel like I have the brush control to get in there and hit those recessed areas mm -hmm. uh, pretty well. And I think that the glue also kind of like will form a little bit of a seal in between individual parts and kind mm -hmm. of fill in a little bit of the gaps a little bit. So I like to put that down first and then I'll go through and I'll, I'll prime it after the fact. So yeah, I think it's it's entirely a matter of preference. I don't think that there's necessarily one way to do it in particular. Mm -hmm. I think if you want to do it um, where you keep the parts separate, you have to figure out a good way to actually hold those little parts For pretty sure. well. So again, sometimes people will use like some poster putty and affix it to something that's a little bit easier to handle to paint all those little parts sure. as they go through and do it. Sure. But yeah, when you go through and you're actually going and doing the assembly, just be really, really uh, cautious with the super glue and not, uh, not overload it in any way. That's gonna cause it to frost up. All right, uh, and we're doing the uh, the pants in this color as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just got kind of like a jumpsuit thing going on. Yeah. Where he's got like the uh, the shirt and the pants are the same color. So you want to uh, just again be kind of careful to like if you have too much paint that's kind of pulled up in the recesses in particular to kind of pull it out of those spots, so you're not really obscuring the detail anyway, and you're getting a nice flat even coat. And again, sometimes that is achieved through multiple layers. I saw someone asking about using water versus using thinner to cut the paint. Yeah, so the, the primary difference there is that water is really going to diffuse it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, every paint is kind of made up of a pigment, uh, a medium, and a binder usually. The binder is kind of what fuses the two of those things together. Sure. And using water kind of disperses those particles a little bit and also makes it very runny and thin. So most of the time I use water, but if I'm trying to do a technique that I want to be like really controlled with mm -hmm. the layers as I'm doing it, mm -hmm. you can mix in uh, matte medium or like there's a lot of different thinners out there. There's like specific paint thinners that you can use. And the, the big advantage a lot of those have is they kind of like do some interesting things with the surface tension mm -hmm. that water don't necessarily do. Um, sure. And I think that you just have to kind of experiment with it. Again, I, I don't think that there is like a definitive one way to do it. People are going to have personal preferences and uh, different levels of comfort and different budgets to spend on all these materials and stuff. So For sure. I think it is, a, it is entirely a journey that is up to you, and you can kind of figure out the best way to, uh, to go about it. Let's go your own way. Go your own way, yeah. So uh, I think you've got pretty much the base coat going on there. So yeah. why, don't, why don't we move on to another color? Well, so again, uh, you want to... Um, you want to then... We can show the close yeah, yeah, we can go up we here. so far. Yes, again, kind of hard to see because the, the base coat color is so similar to, uh, to the primer color. Yep. But yeah, so we've got that guy in there. We've got his, his base dry brushed. So you can see mine is identical Just to Sean's. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. All right, cool. So we're going to go on to boots. All right. That's going to be the next guy here. So we're going to use a color called Jawa Robes. All right. Which is kind of like a nice warm brown. What's that guy? What's yeah, that this guy, guy here. Boots made of Jawa Robes. Yeah, maybe so. You want to kind of thin that guy down a little bit. Get a nice, even consistency on your brush. And then I'm just gonna go through and start to base coat it. And I usually like to start with, um, when I have like one piece that is going like right up against another color, mm -hmm. I kind of like to start with those first. With the, the border, you mean? Yeah, the border between the two of them. Because then, you know, that'll, I'll be real careful with that and I'll kind of define that edge and as far as I wanna take that color. And then I'll just kind of move the guy around and then extend it down throughout the rest. 
And we want to be kind of careful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a bit of a bit of a different color there. So go through, and you'll notice that, like you know, with my technique here, I'm achieving these base coats with a lot of kind of like successive short little brush strokes. And I think that that is a good way to um, deliver the paint from your brush to the miniature. Nice. And it also kind of helps to break up the brush strokes that you might have. And it kind of thins out the paint as you apply it. So yeah, you, you're doing it just right. Yeah. Does that feel pretty comfortable for you? Do, you? do you feel like you would have more control if you moved up closer towards the end of the bristles? Uh, maybe. Oh, give it a shot. It seems like see, a, see seems like a subtle way of saying I should do that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, it's different for other people. You know, it's, uh, that's what works for me. But All right. That well, necessarily I'm going to try it, else. and we'll see. Oh, man. Just just being, I'm being careful to try yeah. and... Uh... Yeah, totally. And, you know, like general time frames, like, you know, a miniature can take... Anywhere from, like, I would say at the minimum, like a decent job with multiple colors, it's probably going to take you close to an hour or so to paint a dude. But it can, you know, professional painters and, like, really high-end folks can spend, you know, hundreds of hours on a single guy. Not, not to say that, that is at all necessary at all for, uh, for getting these miniatures done. But I think that, you know, a general benchmark is probably, like, you know, one to three hours per guy. So in the chat, Jomo7676 says, see how Evan is hunched over? That makes my neck tired all the time. Is there a good way to avoid that? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of that is like the surface that you have, like the painting surface, trying to make sure that it is appropriate height. So when I mean, we have a table here, we're kind of hunched over a little bit right. when we do it. Um, I, a lot of times when I'm trying to do it- I'm saying up straight, yeah, it comes yeah, like right about there. Yeah, it try to helps. It, it certainly helps. So I, I think you want to put like your elbows down on the table and you mm. can kind of keep a better posture but you know, sometimes that's just not the most comfortable and convenient way to paint. So I think that having like a good height to the to your table, which in my opinion is like if you have your arm and you kind of extend it straight out, like wherever your elbows kind of rest, I think that's that's usually kind of like a good good height for me. And mm -hmm. then obviously you, you you want to take periodic breaks. I think it's really easy to like just sit down and want to just soldier on and get a bunch of work done. Sure. But like every 45 minutes to an hour, I usually will kind of put the guy down, I'll go get a cup of coffee, I'll go out check my email, like whatever, just like, just take a break for like five, 10 minutes mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. come back to it. Uh, I, I usually find that um, painting and kind of like smaller increments spread out through a longer period of time is way easier on my back, my muscles, my concentration sure. than just trying to sit down and just like slog through for like three, four hours at one time. All right, so we're going through and we're applying this base coat color to these boots. Mm -hmm. Getting it mostly done. Is that working out all right for you? Yeah, I've moved on to the second boot. All right, boot number two. Boot number two. All right. And I'm not being terribly careful on this base coating stage. Like I want to get like a nice kind of clean uh, an even coat over things, but if I go a little bit outside the line, like I've kind of done here and like made a couple little mistakes, not the end of the world. I think you're going to save a lot more time if you're not overly precious mm. with staying inside the lines in these really early stages. Okay. Because you're just going to go back in and you're going to layer in highlights and up those mistakes anyway. Sure. So I like to save a lot of that kind of refinement process for the very end. And I Good think call. it's more important to kind of get through, and in my opinion, like the base coats are one of the most laborious parts like mm -hmm. it's just it takes the longest to go through and get a nice flat coat and once you get that coat on there and you apply a wash over top of uh, the various areas then going in and applying the highlights um, depending on how far you want to take it is usually quite a bit faster and also a little bit more rewarding like because you get really start to get this kind of dramatic result that you're after sure where sure. things are starting to get defined and and you're seeing a lot more detail Okay, well, I am going to move on to the next bit, if you're ready. I think I'm just about ready. Close okay. Shot. Yeah, always show. Cool. Yep. Go over here. Okay. Now with brown boots. There's my guy. We've done it. Also has my brown boots. My guy's a little boots. bit taller. He's like in first place, and your guy's like in second place. That's does that accurate. Make you feel, does that make you feel bad? Uh, no, it seems, seems accurate. We can, it seems we can about how it should be. We can switch podiums if you want, if it'll make you feel oh, better. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll okay. see. Okay. Lots of time. Lots, Lots of, of time, time to catch up. Lots of time to catch up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right, cool. So the next bit we're going to do is going to require a little bit more control. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll, you'll be fine. Okay, yeah. we're going to use a darker color here. This is called Mimban Mud. Perfect. This kind of nice chocolatey brown. And this is going to uh, be the color that we're going to use for his belt and his holster and the pouches that are on his belt. Sure. So again, I, I want to kind of focus on getting in and hitting up the area in between and like that line that's going to separate these two colors first. And then I'll go in and fill in the middles. So it's kind of just doing the outline first, establishing like the out, outer kind of perimeter of things, mm -hmm. and then go back in and refine the detail mm -hmm. after the fact. It's got like a little strap bit over top of that. Oh, is that a strap going over the gun? Yeah. He's got like, like one of those clip things. Yeah, so it's like the holster part, he has like a scope on the top. Yep, I see that. And then there's a strap that goes from like the back of the uh, pistol grip about to where the front of the scope is. I see that, okay. Yep. But for now, you know, again, because we're gonna go in and we're gonna paint that, that weapon with a metallic color, it doesn't really matter too much if you go a little bit outside the lines because we're just gonna layer in another color over top of that. Where's the uh, where's the finished Luke? Here he is right here. Can I see him for, yeah, a, for a reference? reference? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. That helps. Okay, I see. So those pockets on his jumpsuit are still the jumpsuit color, but he does have that. Yeah, little, but it's just leather just around the belt. Yeah, he's yeah, got like these kind okay. of squarish pouches that are on there. And I'm going in. And I'm trying to get all of the uh, you know the nooks and crannies as I go through and do this. He's got a belt that's kind of like in between the raised patches as well. So I'm trying to get in there and hit those guys up as well as I can. And again, I'm kind of like bridging my two hands together. Like this is a little bit finer detail. Uh, you might go a little bit outside the lines, but because we kind of went back in and did that base coat of his fatigues, if we make any sort of mistakes, it's gonna make that touch up a lot cleaner than trying mm -hmm. to match the primer color that we had before by mixing paints. Gotta get his belt here. All right. So we're doing this part, and then what is gonna be up next? So the next stage after this is, um, I'm, we're gonna go over a little bit of color mixing because I wanna kinda give Luke a little bit more of a ruddy, kinda tanned skin tone. Sure. So we're gonna mix in a little bit of color, um, a little bit of red and a little bit of brown in with uh, the base flesh color that we have here to achieve that. But first we gotta kinda finish the front of his belt and get this stage done as well as we can. And then we'll just go in and start to base coat those areas. Yeah. <laughs> They're making you play with the handicap by constantly telling you. Like, oh, where, where I to need put to put things. Hands. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not really accustomed to uh, to painting for other people to view. So bear with me. It's as okay. I neither am I. Get these guys aligned and put in the right places so people can at home can see. So that little belt buckle right on his front there, that's gonna be like a different color. Yeah, that's it? a metallic color. Yeah. yeah, he's got like a fancy belt buckle. Fancy belt buckle. Or maybe not so fancy, metallic anyway. He splurged for, for metal. <laughs> sure. Okay, so we've kind of gone okay. through and gotten these base coats in here. Yeah. And I see a couple areas here where I wanna go back in, I wanna just touch up a little bit. So I'm gonna do that by going back to my Rebel Fatigues. This color here. I see, okay. And now you can see here, this area where I've kind of like got a little bit of brown on his jumpsuit here, I can just go back in and touch that little guy up. Oh, for sure. Tidy that guy up, tidy up this little area on his yeah, pants. Yeah, I should probably do that too. Yeah, and your little areas where you kind of go outside the lines. Cool. All right. Getting a little bit of it. To be clear, I didn't go outside the lines at all. I'm just making you feel better. You just, you did it perfectly the first time? Right. You should be showing me how to do it then. <laughs> oh. 
So my um, my favorite way to stay motivated with with painting miniatures is to get together with friends uh, during a paint night. So I try to like set up like a weekly day mm. where we'll all meet together in some sort of public space, usually like a game store. Like we're fortunate here and that we have a game center that we can we sure. can get together and play with and paint with. And you all kind of paint together. Yeah, we all kind of hang out and we kind of shoot the breeze and you know talk about different stuff. You know, miniature painting or not related, I suppose. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just, it kind of keeps you motivated, keeps you rolling on getting stuff done. You can share techniques with other people. You can meet other players and schedule some pickup games when you sit, wanna sit down and uh, test out that newest list that you're trying, that sort of thing. So yeah, like talk to your, uh, your local store about kind of setting up a paint night and getting some people together. Or host one at your house, like however you wanna do it. But uh, hosting it at a, at a public spot, I think is always nice because you, you can just meet more people that way. For sure. Yeah, I know there are several groups that will go painting in the in the game center pretty regularly. Yeah, yeah, we try to do it on Thursdays whenever we can. All right. I've got a belt on. How you doing? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I forgot a strap. It's, a, it's all right. He's we, got a he's got a strap that goes around his leg too. I gotta get. Oh, that I got that. It's because I looked at the reference. Yeah, Mini. I was like, and you're really good at this. <laughs> Naturally gifted, some might say. Naturally gifted. <laughs> I think that is a thing to to mention is that um, you know miniature painting is it requires some dexterity, it requires some patience for sure, but it's certainly something that anybody can do. It's like you know any any sort of discipline. I think you just have to spend mm -hmm. a little bit of time. You have to be patient. You have to learn. You have to be willing to. You know, have your first couple pieces not turn out to be masterpieces, but yeah. I mean, you just you learn every time you sit down and, and apply the, the brush to the miniature. So you can pick up some new techniques and just kind of learn what paints and what uh, what different um, ma other materials are really going to benefit your uh, your methods and your your end desired results. Yes, I'm certainly not someone greatly endowed with. Uh, fine motor dexterity mm -hmm. or with patience so but I'm doing it so yeah yeah it's working out just fine and I think that, you know you will find that when we kind of get into some other techniques here shortly um, kind of post wash that uh, you know the texture of the miniature is going to do a lot of the work for you Ooh. it's going to really help out just with the angle that you're going to use on the brush um, different techniques like dry brushing um, just like angling in there and getting all your layering and stuff finished it's going to work out pretty well Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next little bit here. I'm going okay. to start to mix up a color for our floor. All right. So that is going to start off here with, uh, forgive me, just mm -hmm. trying to get these names learned. Junland Wastes is Junland this kind Wastes. of like very light kind of pinkish color here. All right, I, I think that's that guy, right? Yeah, you got that guy right there. And then also right next to it, I put a little bit of that blaster bolt red, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Before you go crazy, close up to your... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Here we go. I so mean, here we are. We can, mine's identical to that. So <laughs> Come, on, Evan. Come on, Evan. It's fine. <laughs> yep, there it is. There it is. Now In all with its glory. more brown. <clears throat> Rotate yours, Evan. There we go. So yep. the back side, you can see that belt's a little bit better. Yep. There it is. Cool. Any other questions popping up? Uh... Let's see, I don't see a question right now. Um, uh, some people talking about Sorastro in the comments. Oh yeah, that guy's awesome. Yeah, he's our good buddy. Yeah, totally. We uh, Highly we recommend. Just got back from Star Wars Celebration where he and I uh, did some painting seminars, and mm -hmm. some tutorials. Mm -hmm. He showed some people how to paint some Death Troopers, a painted Short Trooper and stuff. So his tutorials are fantastic. He uh, goes through a lot of the kind of specific and more advanced techniques, he goes into some cool zenithal highlighting things and blending and mm -hmm. different materials, a lot of different stuff. So if you want to kind of take your painting a little bit further, definitely a good resource to check out. Yeah, he does he, some really, really cool stuff. He does but he, step he's not the only He does step-by-steps of a lot of the minis. Mm -hmm. that you yeah, can, he you does not, not, along um, not only videos, but he also does a number of um, kind of PDFs. So you mm -hmm. can just kind of print those guys off and take them with you to the painting table yeah. and kind of learn them. Yeah. But I, I feel like you know, painting videos are, are really a, a great way to, to pick up techniques because you can just see how they're applying the, the paint and mm -hmm. how they're moving the brushes and just kind of like go through their, uh, their general habits and, and pick up a lot from that. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to go back to mixing some flesh tone color here. Yeah. So we got a little bit of the Splash Bolt Red. Yep. We're going to take a little bit of that Junlin Wastes, about 50-50, but that's way too pink right now. So we're going to take a little bit of 
that brown that we used earlier kind of mixed that guy in there too. So we're gonna get something kind of ruddy. So John. Yeah. I'm super colorblind. What does this mean for my painting career? What does that mean for your painting career? It means that the most important thing is that you're painting miniatures that you think look cool. If that's other fair. people look at them and think they look strange, well, I don't know. As long as they look good. I don't think that's super important. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you can certainly, I don't know what kind of colorblind, well, how are you colorblind? Uh, red, green, and blue, purple. And blue, purple. Right, blue and purple are just like one big old color to me. Oh. I could see like, that's blue or purple. Wouldn't, wouldn't know which one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you can certainly kind of like err on the side of, you know, choosing colors that are a little bit more discernible for you. Okay. As you go through and do it. But, you know, invariably, you're going to, if you want to uh, adhere to how you've seen some of these characters and units in the films and in and shows and other mm -hmm. sources, yeah, you're going to be a little, little um, restricted in that regard. But the nice thing is, is that, you know, all these paints have specific names. So if you want to try to adhere to a specific paint scheme, you can kind of follow tutorials and things that are utilizing these paints. I, I think you'll, sure. you'll find that for, for most acrylics is that, um, mm -hmm. you know, they'll have specific names. They have like a particular recipe or formula awesome. that you want to follow. So you can certainly go through those steps and, and replicate that, even though you actually can't perceive those colors. It's kind, okay. of, kind of difficult yeah. for me to speak on that because, it, you know, obviously I'm and not in those circumstances. Right. That's but. actually a good point, though, that I hadn't really thought of, that a lot of the colors yeah. have names mm -hmm. and that I can use that. Yeah, you can kind of follow the tutorial and, and achieve the results okay. without actually being able to see that seems, how they uh, look to other people. It seems way too pink. So. Yeah, I think you want to take in a little bit of that brown. You want to mix in a little bit because, you know, the flesh tone tier that, we, that we're using uh, for Luca's it's a, a little bit more orangey than just straight red. I see. So you want to mix in a little bit of one of these browns that has a little bit more yellow in it. They kind of achieve that. Oh, like the, the Jumlin or Doom No, this, this guy right here. Yeah, the oh, Jawa like robes. Oh, the Jawa robes. Yeah, oh, I think I the Jawa robes will work out. Kind of achieve that nice base coat color. And I do like these paints. They, they cover pretty well. I think that they're, you know, they're nice and thin. They come out of the bottle. They don't really need to be thinned too much, but the coverage is nice which is always kind of like a, um, a characteristic that I'm looking for with paints. It's like I don't want to spend a lot of time just doing tons and tons of layers. You know, like mm -hmm. invariably you have to put a couple down, but if you're sitting down and have to do like four and five layers, it's just you're spending a lot of time rehashing old ground. You think that's all right or is that too dark? I think that's all right. You think that's all right? Yeah, I think that's okay. We're going to go back in and highlight it a little bit more uh, with subsequent colors. Uh, make it pop. Let's see, Jomo seven six seven six seven six. Uh, how how would you care for your brushes? I think I could do better than rinsing them in water. Certainly, yeah. So um, brushes, you have to kind of think about like hair, mm. in a weird way, because they're made out of bristles, uh, and to condition those things, a lot of times people will also you know use uh, specific brush soap. And the important thing is, is that if you're just using standard water and you're using standard soap, that soap often has like a degreaser in it and that's gonna strip some vital oils out of the bristles that you have. For sure. So if you go to any art supply store, you can find um, brush soap. It usually comes in like a little cake like this. I'll put this up here on the camera, you can kind of see it here. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a solid, solid stuff. And then you're gonna take a little bit of water, you're gonna work out, you know, uh, and get a little bit of the paint uh, worked out through the, the, the ferrule of the brush. And then you just kind of, kind of like rub it out on a, um, on a palette and kind of like take some of the excess out of there and just wash it with that. So I, I certainly recommend this kind of like, um, this brush up that you can get at an art supply store. It's gonna keep the tip of your brush a lot more pointed and it will uh, keep them in good operating condition for a lot longer. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So I'm painting his hands. Yeah, you want to get his hands, his, his face, face, and then also he's got a little bit of neck showing in there too that you want to get in there. Yep. <laughs> They're going to keep yelling at me for that. Yeah. All right, here we go. Oh, oh crap. Mm. I mean, it's perfect. <laughs> you nailed it. Yep. You're doing it. I got his neck exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, we can always do some touch-ups. Don't yep. get too hung, hung up about making it perfect at this stage. I'm not. I mostly just want to get a nice We're proceeding. Coat. This is... We're proceeding. I'm very excited. So it's going to be a little tricky when you have to get in there and do his um, hands on the interior. Yeah, closer I was to his chest. that. Yeah, so again, what you want to try to do is angle this guy around so you can get purchase on that those areas and get a good angle on them. 
but you're still kind of like maintaining like that same sort of positioning with your hand, like whatever, um, whatever posture with your hand is, is really comfortable. So I've got a nice base coat on there. Mm -hmm. and the next area you probably want to look at. Okay. Well, I think you want to probably kind of continue your coat on his, the cheek of his face. Right now he's got a little bit of five o'clock shadow in there because he's showing him a little bit of that, that yeah. base coat underneath it. Okay. So again, yeah, just try to like move and adjust the angle of the miniature so you can get like a nice, good, even coverage. And then kind of start in the areas closest to the, the border with another color and then kind of pull in towards the center and fill in the center bits. Mm, I see, yes. That helps me anyway. Okay, so this skin tone is a little bit darker than what we're going to want in the very end, but it'll be a nice good base coat, and then we can apply some highlights after the fact. Perfect. Cool. Close the shot. All right, here's my fellow right there. Yep, and there's mine. Nice little base coat action. Yep. This way? Correct. There we go. Have them rotate. Bring this All guy right. back a little bit so you can see him. All right, cool. All right. All right, next bit. Yeah. Let's do some hair first. Actually, you know what? Let's do the lightsaber first, because I think that if you go a little bit outside the lines and you get some blue on his hair, it'll be easier to hit the hair than it is to be hit the inside of that lightsaber. For sure. So we happen to have a lightsaber blue. We just happen to. We just happen to. Look at that. <laughs> Seems like it was by design. All right. Which is a nice kind of lighter blue color. I don't know if I have that color. You don't have that guy. He All must right. be right. Is it, is it that one furthest from yeah, us? Yeah, I think so. You got him there? I got it. Is that the one or is that the other one? No, that's the Fleet Trooper color. It's the oh. next one there. Yeah, that's the guy. Lightsaber blue. Light saber blue. Cool. Let's put a little bit of this on your palette there. Okay. I've been waiting for this part. You've been waiting for this part? Yes. So let's start with the area that is closest to his hair first. Again, trying to hit those recessed areas as much as we can. So I'm going to angle this guy in here. And I'm just going to put this against the edge of the, um, the lightsaber itself and just try to keep the pressure down against the lightsaber to try to prevent it from hitting the hair there. But I've not successfully done that as I've hit a little bit off of the side. But again, that's why we're starting with this part because we're gonna touch it up later anyway. You don't really have to worry too much about it. Yeah, he definitely definitely has some blue hair over here. Huh. Well, if you wanna get fancy, you can start to do object source lighting, which is oh. when you actually paint in the lighting effects. Oh, yeah, that, that's what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. That might be. I'm safe. sorry. Tell tell me more about object source lighting. Okay. Lighting. What, what what is that? What does that mean? You're essentially trying to like represent the lightsaber glow that you often see in like a 2D piece of art. Oh, I see. Sure. By painting it in um, into the raised areas, so you're painting in surrounding areas around something that is emitting light um, to represent that kind of refracted reflection around the surrounding areas. Certainly, a technique you can use with lightsabers. It looks very cool. Another nice flat coat to this. I feel like. No, never mind. We're okay. You doing all right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're doing just fine. Hmm. Nice. Okay. Lightsaber covered. Yeah, lightsaber? Covered. Yeah, I can't, Ready to do it. I can't hold them by the lightsaber anymore. That's what I was doing. Oh. All right. Look at that. 
There you have it. Never have you seen so blue a lightsaber. <laughs> okay, and then we got his hair to do. Yeah. That's the next bit here. We're gonna use this color Dune C to kind of represent his like dirty blonde hair. Yeah. His yeah, Tatooine heritage. His Tatooine heritage. Yes. That's right. So that's gonna be that color on the upper left there. Yeah, that guy. There. Yep. Let's go through and get that guy painted. tip of my brush here. So another uh, useful thing to do while you're painting is uh, when you take your brush to the palette, I usually try to twist it a little bit in my hand to kind of keep the tip a little bit more oh, refined. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so as you go through and, and do it, like, and you're taking a little bit of the excess paint off of your brush, mm -hmm. a little bit of water on there, oh, try nice. twisting it in your fingers and it should give you a little bit of a better point, which will give you a little bit more control. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. It's working very well. Okay. Some more of this blonde hair action. Again, being really careful around the lightsaber, try not to get any down on there at all. So if you're gonna paint your own miniatures, where would you start? If I were gonna paint my, my very own miniature, yeah. like what like what uh what uh mini what, would I start with? What faction would you start with? What, I'm what a, miniature would you start with? I love the separatists. I'm yeah. all about those robots. Yeah, totally. Uh, so they're not out yet, so I'd wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um but then when they came out, I would paint them. Yeah, uh, I had a, a lot of fun painting Grievous for the uh the corset. Yeah, I'd probably paint Grievous first. Um, he is super cool. You know, love the fact he's got all those multiple options. You can kind of configure yeah. them in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really interesting. I, I love that direction that we're going with the miniatures now, too. We're, we're providing more options available to you. You can kind of customize and make them a little bit unique if you wanted to by, you know, using different components. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just like the, the Clone Wars stuff really lends itself to that, too, because you have all these different unit markings you can do. Yeah. All these different, like, kind of subunits and different heroes. It's a more, up. like, traditionally militaristic kind of conflict. Yeah, with heraldry and all that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But in a sci-fi setting. Yeah, definitely cool. Very cool. All right. Luke's got some blonde hair. He how does. You, how you doing? His hair is blonde. Awesome. All right, cool. So let's do uh, go with some metallics next. And okay. we're going to pick out his lightsaber, his weapon, and his belt buckle. And that's kind of the last little bit of fine detail. Mine doesn't look so bad when I'm looking at it from it this far away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the thing to actually consider is that, you know, <laughs> the majority of the time you're looking at these miniatures from like three feet away. Yeah. If they look good from that distance, you've kind of achieved what you're really setting out to do. Right, yeah. If you want to be more discerning and so you can actually like pick it up and look at it a little bit closer and feel mm -hmm. really good about it, I mean maybe you save that for some more characters. You don't but you right. don't have to you don't have to have that approach when you're sitting down to paint paint miniatures. I think there's a lot of great examples out there of fantastic painters, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I I just worry that sometimes that people feel like that's the only way to paint and you have to paint to that level in for order sure. to feel good about it. And it's just that's mm -hmm. not the case, you know, it's just you take it as far as you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's go down with some metallics here. We got uh, a little bit of this color here, mm -hmm. which is Astromech Silver. That's yeah, the I, got, guy. I think I got this right here. Yep, you got a little bit of that. So again, we want to kind of thin this down. You want to be a little bit cautious with metallic paints when you're thinning them down, because if you add too much water, it starts to really make the metallic flake in the paint separate a lot. And you're going to start to sure. get like a, a finish that's a little bit more uneven and kind of patchy where you're going to have areas that are re really reflective and shiny and then mm -hmm. it's going to kind of get a little bit more matte as those particles have kind of diffused. Sure. So you want to be a little bit sparing when you're thinning down metallic paints, but at the same time they have a tendency to be a little bit thicker. So it's going to require a little bit of balance to get that, that proper ratio of water to okay. paint. I usually go like two parts paint to one part water a lot of times. It's kind of like the... Two parts paint to one part water? Yeah, yeah. So you put down a little blob of paint, mm -hmm. another blob of paint, and one, one blob of water. Okay. Of, of equal measure, that kind of helps out a little bit. 
So we've got some little tiny details in here to get. Oh so I'm again gonna kind of choke way up on my brush like this so I can get in here and get a little bit more, more control to be able to hit up the uh, the scope of this blaster here. Mm -hmm. And also the, yep, we're just gonna go scope. ahead and paint the handle silver even though it would probably be black, but I'm just gonna go ahead and paint it silver now. Yeah. Just for the sake of expediency. Just try and dot that trigger maybe. Yeah, get that little bit in there. Okay. okay. So again, Got you're kind of like bridging your two hands together, kind of choking up a little bit on the brush, mm -hmm. turning the, the miniature in your left hand a little bit to get the good angle on it. And then um, when it comes to like a lot of little fine detail or edge highlights, which we'll get to a little bit later, um, a lot of times I think the natural tendency is just to go straight in at, some, at a detail. So say these little pouches here have got these little tiny dots on them, which oh, are gosh, kind of like I these little, wasn't even thinking about little that. fasteners, mm -hmm. little bits there. So rather than going in with a pointier brush and trying to like just pinpoint it and hit it, uh -huh. a lot of times what I do, because that's a raised detail like that, I'm yeah. using the side of my brush and I'm just going to kind of like lightly skim over top of it to be able to hit that. So that's, oh, see how that works? Like, yeah. And you can use that same technique for trying to hit up like um, the very edges or, or raised details when you're doing your edge highlights. Ah. So rather than just going in straight at it and trying oh. to trace that contour, <laughs> <laughs> just go a little bit outside the line. It's all good. Yeah, yeah it's all good. It's okay. We're in the base coating stage, man. This it's is a metal this pouch. Is, this is the time to make mistakes because you can always go back in and, uh, and and tweak them a little bit. Yeah. So again, I'm gonna kind of go in a little bit sideways and hit up that little raised area there. I'm gonna kind of keep rotating this guy so was, I can hit up all these little these little pouch buttons. It was really nifty when I did it properly the first two times, and then the third time I kind of biffed it. That's okay. That's okay though. Totally I, fine. I don't mind. I'm not concerned. And then you got to go up here and get the lightsaber yep, above and below his hands. Oh man! Make sure to, to get all that in there. Luke, what are you doing? Again, be a little careful when you're going and doing the inside hand. But his left hand that's on the bottom of the hair, because mm -hmm. you've got some exposed lightsaber now that you want to get silver. Yep. And we'll go up here to the top. Get this little section in here. I went a little bit outside the lines there and got a little bit on his fingers, so I'll go ahead and touch that up in a second here. I think I'll probably touch up that uh, that pouch that I turned half metal. Yeah, yeah, that seems fine. All right, a little bit of touch up on the skin. Let's wrap up this base coat. Up here on the top of his fingers. Uh, someone asked a little while back in the chat yeah. if the paints tell you uh, what colors to use on what part of a miniature, if they're like green pants, tan jacket. That does not really seem to be the case. No, not necessarily. I mean, we have certain things that are a bit prescriptive, like Jawa robes, if we ever do Jawa miniatures. Right, or like, you know, rebel fatigues. Yeah, but at the same time, we try to use some some paints that are not quite so specific, that they just uh, they lock you into kind of only doing one particular uh, application for them. So I think that what, what we are kind of keen to start doing though is like uh, provide some more paint guides and like a little bit more direction using mm -hmm. these paints specifically to kind of show people like the formulas and materials you want to use. Yes. And the techniques that'll uh, kind of take a little bit of the guesswork out of it. I know like a number of people are um, very concerned about the uh, like not being able to mix paints, like they're a little bit hesitant about it if they don't have any sort of like art class backgrounds where they were sure. kind of accustomed to doing that. It's kind mm -hmm. of intimidating for them. So we try to make all these paints a bit sequential. So you've got like a base coat color, a highlight color, maybe another edge highlight color on top of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to mix them up too much. But there are some, uh, some cases, like, you know, in the case of Luke's skin here, for example, where we decided to make it a little bit darker and more tan. So we mixed in a little bit of uh, red and brown in with that. Absolutely. To make it look a, a little bit better. All right. Well, I think my dude is pretty much ready for some washes. Yeah. Same here. Cool. In one second. <clears throat> I'm almost there. Okay. Oh, forgot about his belt buckle. Don't forget that. I got that. I did, I did do See, that. See, you're pretty good. <laughs> you're pretty good at this. No. <clears throat> oh, oh, <I> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. 
<laughs> Three foot rule. Yeah, I, I guess we should uh, certainly, you know, let people know that these paint names are not necessarily indicative of new units and things that we're going to be doing down the road. Yes. Uh, they're es essentially just referencing things that people have seen in films and animated series and other things right. like that. Right. Everyone knows you know, what. They're just kind of yeah. Like. They're just kind of like just general blanket terms. Don't mm -hmm. feel like you know these are uh, very indicative of exactly what we're going to be doing down the road. I think yep. that we have you know a lot of different uh, options available to us, and we don't necessarily want to be constrained by the paint names that we've made. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So we've done this. We've totally gone through. Good. We've gotten this little bit here. They'll probably want to see it. Yeah. Of course they will. Why wouldn't they? All right. Let's see here. Yeah. You see that fella right there? Uh, first place, second place. Very nice. Base coated guys. Yep. John, pull yours back just a hair. Okay. Sorry, guys. Alrighty. Cool. So now we're going to do uh, ink washes. Okay, one sec. Uh, yeah. Someone one says, sec. John, can you explain the rolling technique you're using to apply paint to the brush? This seems important to load the brush. Yeah, certainly. So let's see if we can get a good, a good angle on it here. So um, when you're loading up your brush, again, you don't really want to go much past like the midway point on the brush whenever you have it. But if you look at the brush here, I don't know if you can necessarily see that particularly well. Now it's picking up. There's a big glob of paint on the very tip of that thing. Okay. And what we want to do is as we do this, we want to kind of twist this in our fingers and turn it so it's going to produce a finer tip and more control. So it's taking off the excess of the paint and it's also giving us a finer point on the tip of that brush so we can just get a better angle on it. Um, I think that is just a, you just make that into a habit as, as you kind of proceed and go through when loading up your brush each time. I think just kind of twisting it a little bit as you go through and just getting a nice fine point on there is going to, going to help you out quite a bit. Perfect. Cool. All, All right. right. So next is the magic of the wash. So yes. the wash is uh, kind of like a coffee-like consistency and transparency. Mm. And uh, in this case, because we have primarily a um, tans and browns that we are shading, mm -hmm. we're going to use a color called Strong Tone. And that is okay. uh, essentially like a brown. Uh, it's very kind of muddy. Uh, let me see this here. So this is the Strong Tone here, mm -hmm. as you can see. That's our fella. And I'm going to apply a little bit of that to my palette here and then kind of show you how it looks. So it's nice and black okay. and thick, like cold pressed coffee maybe. Yeah. But as you extend it out, you can see here that it is very kind of like oh, transparent. Yeah. And that it is quite a bit thinner. So I, I like to kind of thin this down with a little bit of water as I go through and do it. It's kind of staining and I don't necessarily want to tint all the colors underneath it too much. I really want to just kind of define all the recesses with this color. And what I like to use, rather than using kind of the standard one size brush that we used previously, is I like to use a larger brush, kind of akin to this one here. It's got a nice Fat belly on it okay. that can hold more material on there. So I'm going to need some of this as well. Yeah, you're definitely going to need to put some of that down on your palette. All right. So. Kind of load that guy up. And thin it down a little bit with water. I, I would almost go like 50-50. Uh, there's a number of people that really like to use mediums in with these washes as well because it kind of keeps, keeps them a little bit thicker um, and a little bit less runny. You know, gravity is definitely going to play um, a lot with this uh, mm -hmm. because it is so thin. That a lot of times, if it, if you just thin it down too much with water, it's going to kind of pull down around the feet of the miniature, and it's going to, you know, sure, going to cause you to have a lot more touch up as you go through and do it. Sure. So I like to start at the top, okay, of the miniature here, and then you're just essentially just going to be painting that in over top of just about everything except for that lightsaber. Over the palette buttons. Yeah. Back. Interesting. There you go. Right here. And you can start to see how it's starting to like just rest in all those nooks and crannies. I see. It picks out all the little Yeah, little exactly. Bits. So you, you want to be careful because you want to have just enough to define all the recesses, but you don't want it to pull so much that it's going to really obscure any sort of detail or um, like just tint it so much that it's not really going to look like the same color that you had before. Sure. It is invariably going to make it darker. But you want to kind of like pull this stuff in towards the cracks and crevices and away from the raised areas wherever possible. There are some people that go so far as to like carry with them like a extra paper towel and they actually wipe it away from the raised areas. Hmm. I've had mixed results with that. Sometimes that works out pretty well. Um, but other times you're just actually just pulling more wash out of the recesses. Sure. And don't be afraid to be pretty generous with that. Like, you know, you can, 
kind of load it up, load up your brush pretty, pretty full. Okay. You know, like really put a decent amount on there. Sure. Thin it down with a little bit of water, and just don't be afraid to like just apply it pretty liberally. But you just want to make be able to to pull it, and in a kind of an even coat across the miniature, so it won't pull up quite so much. So this stage usually takes a, a significant amount of time to dry, maybe 20 minutes or so. Sure. So I, I usually try to save this for like right before I'm going to take a break. Okay. Or if I'm doing um, like batch painting, which is essentially painting several miniatures all at one time. I see. To try to increase your efficiency because you're essentially just using like rather than going back and forth and opening and closing and putting a bunch of different colors of paint on your palette, you're kind of just going through the motions of like painting all of these guys pants brown or painting their boots black, whatever it may be. For sure. Um, and just kind of systematically going through several miniatures at one time. I will say that um, that does get a little tedious at times and I would not recommend doing more than like five to maybe 10 miniatures at one go um, with that kind of batch painting technique. But um, it's gonna produce faster and, and more efficient results for you, for sure, by just kind of setting these guys up because you're not literally waiting for paint to dry. Because you can just set that guy down, go to the next one. By the time that you go through the, the whole batch of, say, five, mm -hmm. that guy at the very beginning of the queue might be dry enough for you to proceed on to the next step. All right, so we're going to just washing most of this guy here and trying to be careful to like not have it pool up too much as we apply it and kind of spread it around, but still get all the definition in all these recessed areas as much as we can. Yes, I feel like I'm getting some pools in some areas, so I'm spreading that out. Yeah, yeah, don't be afraid to kind of pull it out, move it around. Look at this, this is cool. It's kind of my favorite step. I think a lot of people say that it is, you know, it produces the most dramatic results. Mm -hmm. And it is really, uh, a lot of times it just kind of gives you a, a real boost of confidence because like you're going through all these steps, it's not really looking like you planned it. But then once you actually really start to define some of these shadows, it starts to pop a lot of the, the detail of the miniature out and really make it a lot more. Yeah, all of a sudden it's looking. Uh... A lot more defined. Uh, and a lot more dramatic. Like something that I'd actually like put on a table. Yeah, there you go. Get a little bit underneath here. Okay, get some in there. So another thing I actually kind of like to do with the ink wash, and this is totally optional, but I like to paint in a little bit of a shadow underneath where the actual miniature is standing. So I'll use a little bit of wash. I'm thinning it down with a, uh, a little bit of water. And I'm just kind of painting the area in between his two feet where you'd actually stand and where you would cast a shadow underneath. And oh, kind of have sure. like a kind of like a darker line there where you can kind of see it. It's a subtle effect, but I think it looks cool. And then to kind of, kind of diffuse that, I'm going to go back in with a little bit of water. So just straight water on my brush and then just kind of pull out the edges a little bit so it kind of makes it a softer edge on that shadow. All right, what do you think? I think it's looking all right. Yeah, I think you can go a little bit some... heavier with the wash in some spots. You can kind of, if you compare them oh, uh, yeah, together sure. to the yeah, two of them, much darker. You have quite right. a bit, yeah, quite a bit more in the in the recesses there. Pulls so, up on. yeah, let's let's put them up here so okay. people can see. All right, you can kind of see here. So this, which is mine, has got a little bit more of the definition in some of these recessed areas. Um, and this one is got a little bit more uh, kind of like diffused and evenly spread out over top of it. So I think that um, mm -hmm. you know applying just a little bit more shade into those into those recessed spots is going to give you a little bit more contrast All right. and kind of make the uh, the shading step a little bit more effective. Going for it. Going for it. More wash. More wash. Yeah, you don't have to be too careful with it. You just don't really want it to pull up so much that it's gonna. Um, yeah, I think I was just really it. start to to pull itself out of the cracks and just pull around the feet. I was just scared of uh, excessive pooling. Alrighty. 
So we've got one ink washed Luke. Just about. Uh, someone's asking which sets come with the brushes. Uh, that would be the core paint set. So yep. that's the larger one. And the that comes one. with uh, the two brushes there. So you get the size one and the size double zero. Yeah, yes. This guy and this guy. Mm -hmm. And then these are just some extra brushes that we got from the craft store that are good for washes, good for dry brushes, things like that. You can certainly uh, pick them up at uh, any local retailer. Right. How are you feeling about that? I think this is looking a bit more shadowy. Yeah, what yeah it looks think? good. Yeah, yeah once it, it's a little deceptive too because it's kind of shiny right now, so you can't really see how it's going to rest in there. But once it actually dries, you're going to see right. that it's, uh, it's going to define a lot of stuff. So speaking of which, we kind of like prepared one of these miniatures, uh, or actually two of these miniatures ahead of time that have already had these ink washes dry, so you don't actually have to sit here and wait for it. Right, so. we're not going to literally make you sit here for 20 minutes while yeah, these guys exactly. dry. So, Here's where they look currently. And then in 20 minutes, yeah. they will look like... They'll look like these fellows. Exactly. Exactly like that's, these that's, guys. That's what mine looks like. Through movie magic. Yep. Ta-da. Ta-da. Look at those guys <laughs> right there. Two fellows. <laughs> so let's pop these guys off of here so we can still use our little handles. Yep. And you want to kind of just bunch up the blue tack here into like a little nice mountain in the center and then press the guy on top of it. Go. And this is just poster putty. There this is not set that fancy. guy over there somewhere. Yeah, I got him. All right. I'm sure. Okay. And now we have four Lukes. All right, cool. All right, I got some orange paint on this thing. All right. Okay, cool. So we've gone through and done that. Uh, just to kind of show these guys again, you'll notice that in some of these fellows. They have like some areas where the wash is kind of pooled excessively around some little spots here and there. So we want to go back in and we want to layer up with the same base coat colors that we used previously. I see. Dodging the recesses as much as possible to keep those nice and dark. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a technique called overbrushing and it kind of functions very similarly to how dry brushing works. Okay. But rather than taking almost all of the paint off of your brush, mm -hmm. you're taking the majority of it off but you still have like a, a decent amount like you're going to base coat. Mm -hmm. But you're just kind of skimming over the raised areas by turning the brush kind of on its side and hitting those raised spots with the base coat color. Okay. So let's let's go through and start to do that. So you want to go back to your one brush for this guy. And let's start off with... Um, number one. Yeah. And do I want it dry? Um, not terribly, no. I think oh, you, okay. want, you want to thin it down a little bit, but you want to take off some of the excess of the, um, of the paint. It's nice and kind of um, just kind of coats over top of the brush but is not like an, uh, an excessive amount. I see. Yeah, so go ahead and load up your brush with this, add a little bit of water to it, and then okay. take off some of the excess there by twisting it again. And then rather than going in here and stabbing at this directly, I'm gonna kind of take the side of my brush and just kind of lightly skim over top of these areas here to kind of pick them out. Kind of using the side of my brush to just hit those raised areas as much as possible. I see. Just you kind of see how that works? Kind of the raised part. Yeah, and you're kind of like just, just change the angle on it so you're just kind of hitting those raised spots pretty well. And again, you don't want to you don't want to get to the point where you are like getting down in the nooks. Well, you're just hitting like those raised folds. And then when you really need to get in there and get a little bit more precise, turn... Uh, Turn the brush up so the point is closer. So again, up here on the top, we're just gonna kinda use the side of this thing, kinda hit these things up. Right up here on the shoulders. Hmm. Is the angle working out okay for you? Uh, yeah, I think that's working out pretty well. Okay. I, think, I think the important thing that you want to do is try to go perpendicular to, like say you have a fold, mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily want to just trace that fold exactly like in the same uh, angle. You uh -huh. want to try to like turn your brush a little bit so you're going to be like going against the grain, so to speak. You know, okay. I'm, kind of, I'm not necessarily just traveling right alongside this right here. I'm trying to go like a little bit against it but I'm applying a really light pressure, so I'm not getting down in the cracks as I go through and do it. 
Okay, I kind of see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, you're yes. just you're, you're trying to just hit the raised areas as much as possible, and by changing the direction so you're not following the channel of a recess mm -hmm. and going kind of against it is going to give you a little bit easier job of highlighting those those raised parts because it's not going to dip down in there quite so much. I think you'll also notice that a lot of times I, I'm using like my thumbnail here to take a little bit of excess paint off because it's just convenient. It's kind of a force oh, of habit. Okay. I think it's a handy thing. Some people use like the, you know, the the flat of their hand right here to do it, but um, I find that it is a, a handy thing to do to to get the consistency just right. So for these highlights, you kind of want to focus on like think about where the light would be coming down on it. So like the light should be like at the top of his head and the top of his shoulders, um, whereas like his armpits or like you know, below his belt, things like that, kind of in the knee pit, those are going to kind of remain a little bit darker. So I see. we can kind of keep painting this as if the light was like right above him. And that's usually called like zenithal highlighting. Sure. Which means that light is at its zenith. It's at the very top and shining down. Yes, yes, yes. So um, some people will use uh, spray primers to achieve that sort of effect um, or airbrushing to mm -hmm. achieve that as well. And it's a, it's a good way to, uh, in the early stages of painting, to kind of define some of the shadows and the, and the recesses before you even start to apply your base coats. Sure. Kind of gives you a bit of a road map that helps out. Um, hair color. Just Moving on to the highlights for the hair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're essentially just going back in with the same colors we used previous and just popping those out a little bit. So the, the wash has kind of tinted all those areas a little bit darker and this makes a nice transition back from those shadows into the, into the highlights. And then when we're done with that, we can go back in with as many highlights as we want to go using successively lighter colors to define more and more um, of the raised areas, mm -hmm. but it just kind of depends on how far you want to take it. I typically only do like two to three layers of highlights for most sure. most army guys, most of my rank and file. Mm -hmm. um, but for the characters, I'll spend a bit more time. What is the most layers of highlights you've ever done? Oh, competition miniatures, I don't know, 15 wow. probably. But it's like, you know, that's... I don't, I don't think that there's like a set number for success. You know, a lot of it is also just how you've applied those highlights and it's, it's all about the edges and the transitions of colors from the shadows to the, and contrast is certainly a huge part of it too. Mm -hmm. Like just getting, you know, a good level of definition in, uh, for all these little details. Yes. against the green here a little bit. So alternatively, you could also, if you were uh, trying to speed up this process a little bit, kind of like we mentioned before, you could achieve a lot of this highlighting with a dry brushing technique as well. Mm. But it's gonna kind of produce like a little bit of a chalky, a little bit of a regular highlight you know, over top of things. I see. So, um, and also it's gonna be very messy. So like if, if I was gonna go through and do that sort of thing, it would be like base coat Luke's tunic and his pants, maybe wash it and then just do a light dry brush over top of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then go back in and paint in all the other details because again you're just going to be going outside the lines with a messy technique and just having to do a lot of redundant painting. I see. Okay, when it comes to like all these jacket pockets and things in here, because they're kind of um, underneath his arms a little bit, they're a little tricky to get in there and do. So I'm just going to, again, try to go against the grain by moving like kind of laterally across his chest because he has a lot of vertical channels in sure. these pockets and try to hit those up as well as I can with these highlights. Again, I'm not really like painting this guy like a competition standard, so I'm not really too worried about super fine details, but I do want to get a little bit of definition in there and a little bit of contrast and all these like cool little details on his shirt. Okay. 
How's that coming out? Uh, I'm not really sure. I think it looks pretty good. Okay. Um, I think one thing that might help out a little bit mm -hmm. is that we can go back in and we can kind of, in the areas where your highlights have dipped down into some of those recesses, mm. just go back in with a little bit of that shade, of uh -huh. that ink wash color that you had before, and just with this size brush, go in and just trace those channels again. I see. Just go in and just try to repaint those little bits. Let me see if I can find a good example on this guy. Yeah, like right here. Go in to find some of those those pockets on his arm there. Yeah, I guess something that I don't know why, but uh, I feel like I, uh, you know, I'll paint it and then I'll be like, oh, I messed up, and then I'm like, dang, it's stuck that way. But it's like it's no. not, you know. I can go back and exactly. And, that's a, you know, a huge part of miniature painting is just touch up and refinement. Yeah, and I, that's kind of why I. I, I encourage people to not get too caught up in the early stages of things because mm. invariably there's just going to be a period of time where you're going back in and you're fixing mistakes. And sure. I try to save that towards the very end. So a mm -hmm. lot of times when I'm sitting down to paint a unit of guys, I'll do like five at a time. Right. I'll do all the base coats, I'll do all the washes, kind of as I, as, as I described previous, where you're um, letting it dry and then moving on to the next guy and kind mm -hmm. of going through this kind of sequence mm -hmm. of, of painting them all. And then once I get them all up to a certain level and about to this level here, then I start to just pick up them each individually and fix all the mistakes because there's sure. going to be one mistake that's not going to be on this guy that is on the other one or, you know, so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. you can go mm -hmm. back in and you kind of refine and, uh, and polish them up as you go. Cool. Okay, so we've got uh, the base of the, um, of the tunic all kind of like highlighted up. Yep. So let's do... Uh, the boots next. So again, okay. go back in with your Jawa robes. Yes. Let's call it here, the Jawa robes. Yes, the one that looks like Jawa robes. The one that looks like Jawa robes. Yeah. And then he's got, um, the Jawa robes are pretty much used for his uh, his boots, which are slightly different colored, a little bit lighter and a little bit more orange than his, uh, his belt. So you've got a bunch of these kind of like, um, kind of parallel straps on his boots yeah. as you go through and do it. Yeah. So again, you can go in and you can try to be very careful and meticulous and paint each one of these raised areas as you go through and do it. Or you can take your brush on its side like this and then just try to like lightly skim over the top of those things to kind of pick those out and pick up the raised spots of them. And I think that that is usually a little bit easier and a little bit more forgiving to get those the kind of initial paint touch up done. And then you can go in with a, a finer brush and more... Um, Kind of more careful painting to pick out the uh, the highlights a little bit more as you go. Oops, so you're just kind of going against the grain here. Mm -hmm. You could certainly also uh, employ a dry brushing technique here because this is the kind of texture that's really good for that. Um, and that it is, you know, a number of kind of parallel rib things that if you just go against the grain, um, that's going to produce pretty good results. But I wouldn't really recommend like a giant dry brush to do that. I think you want to go back in with a brush kind of akin to this one. Sure. You know, this guy is, uh, I think he's a number, number two, I think, but he's a little, he's one of my older ones and he's a little bit more frayed. So mm -hmm. I'm not really too worried about um, the tip. Uh, one thing I will mention is that dry brushing is really hard on brushes and it will um, cause those bristles to fray out quite a bit. So you don't really want to uh, use your good brushes or your, uh, your finely pointed ones for that. Effect. For sure. Yeah. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to do a little bit of that dry brushing before. And I'm just taking a lighter color just to kind of show you how this works. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm just kind of like lightly skimming over the top of this stuff to pick out those raised areas. I see. Sure. Which, sure, sure, sure. which is a nice nice way to go about it, I think. Uh, let's see. Some people are asking if the paints are going to be available as singles. Uh, they are currently not. Uh, we're only selling the just these paint sets as exactly as they are right here. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, maybe in the future. We yeah, might, I think so. Look into that. I think there might, you know, there might be a demand that you yeah. know that people are replacing these things. And um, you produce the demand, and, yeah. uh, and we'll, we'll see we'll where it goes. Supply it. Uh, they do specifically note white running out fast for imperial players. In the imperial paint set, there are several different whites. Yeah, uh, yeah, of varying um, um, darkness levels, I guess, and different values. Yeah. Um, Yes, they're not the same white. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then when it comes to just straight white, I mean, there are a lot of other um, manufacturers that just sell just straight colors like that. Yeah. If you really wanted to buy just like a single color, uh, you can find some other acrylics. 
from other folks. But yeah, I, I think that you know the ratios, and we, we were kind of intentional about like the you know the colors that we chose here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We included like a gloss varnish in with the imperial set, so you can actually apply that over uh, top sure. of the, the stormtrooper armor yeah, in a thin absolutely. layer to kind of give that cool uh, shininess to their um, to their armor, which is definitely cool. Yeah, I think that the ratios of the paints are, are pretty good as far as um, as far as just getting whole units painted. You'll yes. probably use them in, in pretty equal measure, but you know results may vary. Exactly true. Exactly true. All right, cool. So I've kind of gone through and I've I've done like kind of a quick little dry brush over top of these raised areas. Mm -hmm. It looks like your uh, your boots are in pretty good shape as well. Yeah, I think that I'm pretty happy with how they're looking. They yeah. seem like they're looking okay. Yeah, it looks solid. Cool, so you've gone through and you've added a little highlight to his hair, so I'm gonna go through and do that. And then we yes. should probably show the camera here real quick, kind of like the current status of these fellows. Okay. Okay, and here. Again, I'm gonna kind of choose like a lighter color for the very top of his hair. I'm gonna try to use the side of my brush as much as I can to kind of pick up those raised areas, not really going down into the cracks and crevices, if I can avoid it. Just trying to let that texture do a lot of the work for me. Yeah, that's something else that has stood out to me in painting a miniature for the first time is how much you can kind of let, you know, the textures do a lot of the. Yeah, I think that's the thing that the you know people are often just equating this to like two D art where you don't really have those guidelines, um, or those those kind of surface details to kind of like guide your your techniques as you go through and do it. Mm -hmm. The groggy dog is being very charitable when they say they just make this look so easy. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not making anything look easy, but. <laughs> yeah, the largest, you know, the, the, the biggest obstacle I think often uh, from entrepreneurs is just sitting down and doing it. And yeah. again, you don't have to feel like you have to nail it the first try. Like mm -hmm. you're gonna develop techniques and you know, habits that are gonna make that process a lot easier for you mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, right out the gate, just it's fine to fail. I think you're gonna learn the most that way. Okay, cool. So let's do uh, let's do some flesh tone stuff. Right. So we uh, remember we mixed a color before for our flesh tones. We did. We did. So we want to kind of duplicate that again, okay. but just with a little bit more of that lighter color that we had before. So that is that uh, Jundland Wastes. A little more Jundland Wastes. A little bit, yeah, but don't forget to also get in a little bit of that brown. And if you really want to, you could certainly set up a, um, like a batch of colors. If you're gonna use these very often, mm -hmm. you can mix up a certain uh, batch of, of paints and then kind of put them together in a bottle and oh, then save those for yeah. later. Yeah, by just kind of like pouring out a little bit of the paints. Uh, the, the lids of these things will mm -hmm. pop out so you can, mm -hmm. uh, you can pour some in and out of there however you want to. Okay, so when it comes to faces, you've got kind of some key areas that you really want to hit and make sure uh, to put some, some detail onto. And that is going to be like the nose, the cheeks, the brow, the chin, and okay. like kind of like the jawline along the very bottom. So again, we're going to kind of use that technique where we're using the side of our brush to kind of like hit up okay. and like hit a lot of these raised spots. You know, I'm kind of going at it sideways here a little bit, a little bit down here on his chin as well. And you want to be a little cautious. You don't necessarily want to have like too much of a shadow underneath his cheekbones, because that can kind of make him look very like pallid and um, I don't know, like skeletal almost. Mm -hmm. So you want to extend that down. You want a little bit of definition for that recess, but you want to try to make it slight if you can. Yeah. Hmm. Seen the angle on it? Perhaps. Yeah, try them. Um, try, so let's try to do the cheekbone first. So you want to start in here, like right at, towards the very kind of bridge of the nose. Uh huh. And pull this guy out of there like that to hit that cheekbone. Got it. Okay. And mix in a little, you want this color to be lighter than the base coat color it is, too. Okay. Because we're, we're really trying to like pick out the raised areas and for the highlights. I see. About like that, maybe? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay. So remember to kind of twist your brush as you go. You want your, your the tip of your brush to be pretty fine on this. Yep. And then for this other side, rather than me trying to like cross over and do it this way, I'm actually gonna flip this guy around like this. So he's kind of upside down here. And then I'm just gonna do the same thing from the inside close to the, the nose and then just pull it out to get that cheekbone. And we're gonna 
and pull it down here a little bit lower, extend it down his chin. This is where the real the real skill difference becomes apparent. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. No, this is okay. This yeah, is, just, this is working. Try to just adjust it in such a way that you're just kind of following those raised areas as much as you can. Like, let that guide your brush more than anything. Okay. And I think that that will become more apparent the more you paint. Like, how you need to adjust. Let's see. Uh, And when it comes to the hands, same sort of situation here. You got a bunch of fingers in there, and each of those fingers have a recessed area alongside them. So rather than me just going in straight at this thing and trying to paint each one of those fingers, mm -hmm. which is a way to do it, but I'm gonna take off some excess paint here on my brush, and I'm just gonna try to lightly skim over top of those to be able to pick those out. Kind of on the knuckles? Yeah, kind of on the knuckles. On the top part here, and also down here as well. Then I can go in with a little bit more careful painting and really pick out the individual fingers if I want to, but it's uh, for right now we're just mostly trying to like hit the raised parts of the hand as much as we can. So the top of it, trying to paint over a little bit of that shade that kind of filled in some of the raised area there. Sure. And a little bit of this fella too. It's like this one angle where I can hold it at where the hands look really good. So I'm just like, oh yeah, that looks That's good. That's what you have to do. That looks, that looks good. That's how that fellow's gonna go on your shelf, right there, <laughs> just propped up. So he's got yep. that proper hand yep. model got angle. Got that hand model angle. Yeah, it's vital. <laughs> gotta find this guy's best angle and then. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I'm gonna go in with uh, just this straight Jundlin waist. This is gonna be like my final highlight color. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, if you feel comfortable to go in and just apply these like final highlights, go for it and do it but it's certainly not necessary to get it like a good tabletop guy. So I'm gonna put a little tiny dot on the end of his nose. Pick that out, a little bit here on the cheeks. Hit those little bits. Again, I'm gonna kind of twist this on my thumbnail here to get like a good point on it. Mm -hmm. On his chin. Up to you how far you wanna take it. I think we, we passed the limits of my ability a long time ago. <laughs> so. Well, you're learning things. Like I that. am learning things. That's, Good. That is Good. how you learn. Awesome. By passing those limits. All right. Yeah, this guy's looking all right. Cool. That's looking pretty good to me. What? Uh, what next? So let me see, we've got all those little areas done right now. Let's uh, let's go through and try to do a little bit of edge highlighting. So you've got these nice boxy shapes in these like um, belt pouches here. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be a good place to try to illustrate um, these edge highlighting things. So an edge mm. highlight is essentially a very fine highlight that's on the very most raised and extreme surface. Okay. And it's usually done with a considerably lighter color than the base coat color to add a lot of contrast. So I'm gonna go through, and I'm gonna take, because this, um, this section here is um, with Mimban mud, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take that color, but I'm also gonna mix in a fair amount of this lighter kind of um, yellow color, the dune, sure. dune sea. Sure. So I'm getting a, a color you know, that's quite a bit lighter than that base coat. Then again, I'm gonna take a lot of that excess off, off of my brush here, kinda of twist it in my hands. And then when it comes to these little guys, I'm, I'm gonna try to use the edge of my brush as much as I can, mm -hmm. take off some excess, and I'm just gonna skim it right along that, that top edge. See how it has just sure. popped that little guy out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just try to like trace trace that little corner and just have that guy just like rest right, at, right up across that edge as you go through and do your highlight. Mm -hmm. And that is just a, a technique that I think is gonna make your edge highlights a lot crisper, a lot finer. That's pretty cool. And it's applicable on every surface, you know, just, just about any sort of like finished area that you want to go through and paint. You can just use this cool little side of your brush technique to get in that, that nice sharp edge highlight. 
And if you make a mistake, you can always go back in with that base coat color, whatever you chose, uh -huh. and shade the highlight off a little bit. Like if you go a little, sure. bit, a little bit wonky, you get a little bit like askew, mm -hmm. you can go back in with that color and just tidy it up a little bit to give you a nice clean line that's going to define things. All right, a little bit on this guy here. We're getting pretty close to being done here. Yeah. I think we might want to do a little bit of highlights on his lightsaber. Yeah. I think that would be cool. That would be cool. We'll do like kind of the, the quick and dirty lightsaber method here. All right. My favorite kind of lightsaber. Yeah, me too. All right. Use the side of my brush again. Try to get in there and hit up that little raised edge. Uh, let's see. Toek in the chat is asking about eyes. Okay. Uh, that's certainly beyond my abilities, but maybe you just want to like... Eyes are tricky. Yeah, like eyes are tricky. So... It's going to be really hard to pick it up on the camera here because it's so small. So maybe I'll try to illustrate it with a palette. Mm -hmm. Close up would probably be palette. Okay. Well, it's. I think it'll be easier to illustrate it on the palette here for people to see. So I think that uh, what I typically do for eyes, in particular, let me see if we've got a white here. Here we go. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this paint and I'm going to create an eye shape. You know, so I'm just going to flood that whole eye cavity with this white paint to begin with. And it's okay if it goes a little bit outside the lines or outside the cheekbones. You don't want to get too crazy with it, but you want to just try to get that basic, you know, this, it's hard to pick up on white paper, I know. So I'll try to like outline it here a little bit. So say we've got a surrounding color of flesh here, you know, and it's going around this eye. So this is kind of our eye shape that we have going on. And we've gone through and we've kind of put a, a nice flat white, bright white in there to, to achieve that. Now we want to go in with black, which I don't have handy. So I'm going to use brown. I'm just going to use this Mimban brown. Just pretend he's a brown eyed guy or girl. Um, and then at this point, you're going to, this paint is not dry necessarily, but I'm going to start here. I'm going to chuck way up on the brush. And I'm going to start above the eye here, and I'm just going to kind of draw a line straight down and through that eye shape, mm. whatever it may be. And it's going to look kind of cat-eyed at first. But you're going to achieve, you know, and, and just kind of repeat getting that dot of that eye in there. There's a couple different ways you can go about this, but this is, this is how I typically prefer to do it. And because I'm starting at the top and I'm going all the way down through the eye here, um, it's giving you a nice flat way to make sure that those um, the pupil of the eye is kind of centered mm -hmm. in the in the white space there. Right, right. It gives me a nice like easy way to just track and just do a, a nice flat clean line mm -hmm. through the whole thing. Now after that, then you obviously want to do some touch up, and that's when you go back in with your paint and, and go back in, and you're going to tidy up that eye by painting around it and bring it more in line. So you're you're painting around the eye to just tidy up that eye shape right. as you go through and do it. Alternatively, the other method that a lot of um, people will use is they'll actually like paint in their entire eye thing, and then rather than painting the um, dot of the eye, they paint the entire eye black, and they put two tiny dots of white on either side of it. I mm -hmm. feel like that is a little bit more, it's more prone to getting kind of this cross-eyed look on the, on, on the eyes because you have sure. to, you're aligning two dots as opposed to just trying to paint the pupil in one. Sure. So it's, sure. It, it's certainly tricky. Painting eyes is never a very easy thing to do. I use a teeny tiny brush. I mean, what is this guy? A triple zero, I think. Like really finely pointed, mm -hmm. um, which you might be able to see here. You know, this is very, very small um, to achieve all those eyes and get all those guys painted in there. And certainly eyeballs are not the most necessary thing. Um, they, they look great when you get them right, but they look really bad if you don't get them right. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to require a fair amount of practice, but that's my recommendation. I think just flood the entire eye area with white, go through, paint in the pupil, get that aligned. And if you if it gets a little bit askew or whatever, it's not mm -hmm. that much touch up. And then mm -hmm. go back in and paint the surrounding area to tidy it all up. Yeah. And then go back in and do the highlights and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll usually, if I'm painting a face and I'm painting the eyes, I'll do the eyes like really early on, like one of the first steps. Sure. Because it'll just help, you know. Once you get that part dialed in, it's like kind of the more difficult uh, portion of it and the mm -hmm. more detail focused part. Mm -hmm. Then you can mm -hmm. go back in and just build up and do all the touch ups to, to make it all look. That makes sense. Line. Does that help? Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Cool. Yeah. So we've got these, uh, these fellows kind of base coated. We've mm -hmm. got them washed. We've got them highlighted with the first coat. Uh, now we've got a lightsaber to do. Yeah. So are you ready to learn a little bit about blending? 
Yeah. Okay. Show me the ways. So there, there's two different uh, styles of blending. W okay. One is uh, you have a, a dry base coat, and then you're applying a, a lighter or darker color over top of it and diffusing it with water to achieve the gradation between the two colors okay. and using transparency to make one color fade into the next. Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The other way is wet blending in which you are actually painting wet paint on top of wet paint and then feathering the edges to make them uh, blend into one another. Okay. okay. So in, in this case, I think it's going to be easier for us to do the, um, the first one that I suggested, which sure. is, um, so there's a lot of different ways you can actually achieve uh, this overall look, but I think that I like to kind of put the lightsaber um, glow to be kind of close to the base of the hilt. So I'm gonna go with just straight white here, which might okay. seem like a little extreme, but I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna apply like a, just a, a little light. Is this that straight white Stormtrooper armor? Yeah, Stormtrooper armor. Okay. So I'm gonna apply a little bit of white right there. Next, I'm gonna take a little bit of water off of my brush, take a little bit of that blue that we used for the base coat color, and then I'm just gonna to start to feather in that edge a little bit as I go. So you start at the base there, and then you just um, try to use a little bit of water to try to like feather and pull that out a little bit as you go through and do it. Now this is a technique that is certainly going to take a little while for you to, to understand. Yeah. And, and to master, <laughs> and it's super intimidating to a lot of people. They're like, oh, what blending? Blending is like I just don't have the, I don't have the sensitivity to the materials to really figure out the best way to do it. But it's um, the big thing is is you just think about the edges more than anything. Like you want to put down the, the base color. And then as you go through and do it, you just want to kind of feather out that edge. So just take a little bit of that straight white and put it along the very bottom of it. The very bottom of the, the hill yes. the right there. Right along here. Yeah. And then quickly take your brush, take a little bit of water off of it, and then you're just going to try to feather that out by pulling up the paint. Hopefully the people at home can see this. It's a little subtle. Pulling that up towards the top. And take a little bit more water and then just kind of like feather it out a little bit. Again, this is certainly not something that most people are going to be doing on the first day, but for the sake of just trying to illustrate a technique, I thought it'd be kind of kind of cool to show. Yeah. So you don't really want to go too far up the brush. Oh, or, or, I think you kind of you kind of just coated the whole thing with a little bit of white. Uh, sorry, I thought that's what do we were doing. Do as I do, not as I say. Come on, Evan. All right. Anyway, just kidding. So, so All right, no. we can fix that. It can okay. be fixed, yeah. my friend. All right, so you want to go back in with a little bit of this blue? Yep. Start at the very top. We're going to do this thing in reverse. So start with a little bit of that blue up here at the okay. tippy top, yep. at the very tip of the lightsaber. Take your brush back into water. Take a little bit of the excess off. And then you're just going to kind of feather that color back down. That's definitely the coolest thing I've learned about Mitch's painting is that, like, all of your mistakes can be fixed. Yeah, 100%. Like, just, 100%. Just walk it back. You decide when the miniature's done. It's entirely up to you. All right. Oop, seeing a little bit of areas here. I'm gonna go back in. I'm gonna touch back up those little, little details. So at this stage, I'm kind of at the point now, if I was batch painting a bunch of guys, where I'd be going in and I'd be doing all the touch-ups. So you want to kind of just like look at areas that you want a little bit of skew, a little bit outside the lines. Go through, touch those little fellas up. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, prioritize, I suppose. <laughs> you got to pick and choose whichever one. That's I don't think that guy looks too bad. I think he looks pretty good. Well, I mean, all the base cuts were done by you, so. <laughs> <laughs> we did cheat a little bit. We yeah. Did. This is true. <laughs> all right, cool. I'm just going to go back in and pick out these little details here. Mm, this guy's looking pretty all right. Yeah, almost done. Home stretch. I say the very last stage for last. I call it a victory lap. Hmm. And what that is is essentially you are painting the base rim whatever color you want to do. So we could keep it this color, but I kind of paint those base rims a little bit of a darker color oh. in general. So after I've gone through and, and done everything else, I like to paint that very last because if I'm not using one of these little holder fellows, mm -hmm. uh, I would be holding the base rim the whole time and probably rubbing off the paint as sure. I go through and do it. So I think it's uh, it's certainly handy to um, save that for the, one of the last stages. Okay. 
All right, and it's just satisfying to kind of paint that last little bit. So victory lap time. Yeah, victory lap time. Let's do it. So um, I, I think that this color is pretty cool. It's a, a color that uh, we already used on his belt yeah, a little bit. A you know, if I was deciding. Right? Yeah, exactly. And it'll be very similar to uh, the fellow that we, we painted for the studio model. And we're, I'm going to use this larger brush here. Oh. <laughs> Whichever one you want to use doesn't really matter too much. And this is probably going to take a couple coats to go through and do it, but you just want to trace around the outside, follow it around. Chef Steve 65 says, this is the one of the best tutorials I've seen. Would like to see more. Well, that's very complimentary, considering there are a lot of people out there that do this sort of thing. There are a ton. There so, are a ton. So you can find more. You can certainly and, find uh, more. And if, if you'd like to see more of these, let us know in the comments. Yeah. Because we are certainly... Uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to do this Certainly not opposed to doing more of these. Maybe we'll do one with like advanced painting techniques. And yeah, I will for not sure. Be here. Yeah, we can, uh, we can get into <laughs> a lot of different stuff. There's uh, a lot of... I like painting vehicles, which I like to, to do, weathering mm -hmm. on vehicles, uh, basing techniques. Um, there's a lot of different uh, avenues we can go with these kind of tutorials. And the great thing is, is that now we have a range of paints that we can refer to to give people a lot of specificity in the techniques we and do. the colors used. So these very I'm excited for that. I'm, I'm definitely excited to use these paints. Yes, absolutely. Gonna take a little while for these coats to dry and get a nice flat, flat even coverage. When you're going with like a really dark, dark paint over top of a light base coat, it usually takes a few coats to get a nice, nice even coverage on. Yeah, I feel like, like my first coat is not dried yet, and I'm just like moving the paint around, kind of. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a little thinner in your case. Yeah, usually for this this last stage, I don't thin it down too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've gone too far down thin. Yeah. See, learning has occurred. You're like, oh, for next time, I'm not yes. going to thin down that paint so much. Yes. Well, that's okay. All righty. It's, uh, it's an effect. It makes it look like it has been painted by <laughs> someone <laughs> who doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, you know more than you started. That's so true. I know way more. All right, we've hit diminishing returns with mine officially. Yep. Yep. Officially. You throw the towel in. Yep. All right. Well, remember, you can always go back. I can't always go back. No, I think I'm going to have these guys like sit at my desk. All right, let's put these photos. This, we'll put these photos up so, here. All right, here's mine. You nailed it. Yep. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this one's mine. Here, we'll get this guy out of there. Yeah, let's let's not put them side by side. Yeah. <laughs> that, that guy took about five times as long to paint than the, these ones did, which really kind of shows you, like, you know, if you want to spend a lot of extra time and like doing a lot of the refinement and, and detail on things, that is mm -hmm. entirely up to you. You take it as far as you really want to. Yes. But the most important thing is that you are happy with the results and you, uh, you enjoy the overall effect. Yeah. And so here is kind of the the one that John was just talking about. Is that in shot there? Yeah. Uh, that took a lot longer. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I think well, that largely sums it up, I think, uh, for kind of an introduction to to painting miniatures. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of discuss or any other questions we have? Uh, uh, I, did chat not, we I did not see any. Uh, last call for questions. Uh, if you have any questions uh, on painting, uh, I've seen a lot of outpourings of support for uh, doing more of these. So awesome. I'm sure we'll have yeah. you back at some point. That'd be cool. Uh, I'd be into it. Um, so yeah, we just announced these paint sets, as we kind of mentioned at the mm -hmm. beginning. These are our Star Wars Legion paint sets. Mm -hmm. There's a Core and a Rebel and Imperial. More information on all of them is on the website. That's what we've been using to mm -hmm. paint these uh, wonderful miniatures that you see here. And yeah, so you guys can go and learn more about that. And let's see, I'm not seeing any more questions right now. 
awesome. All right. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Make sure that you subscribe, click the bell icon so you're notified whenever we post new content. Come back this coming Tuesday, we're gonna be doing a, a panel with a number of different people from the studio talking about crafting narrative in our game. So we're gonna have like um, a game designer, a, an art director, someone from the RPG team, uh, all talking about like how narrative kind of goes into these games mm -hmm. and how, how we kind of build that. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And thank you everyone so much. We'll see you next time.